inflation is just not what they say it is. For the longest time, we've been given this idea that inflation comes from a red hot economy, in particular the labor market. When the unemployment rate is low, that means we have to compete for workers or businesses have to compete for workers and that drives up the price of everything. Or economists tell us, hey, oil prices. Oil prices drive up the cost of everything. So that's inflation. And other economists, especially those working at central banks, they say, no, it's expectations. When you start believing in price increases, that alters your behavior and then it becomes inflation. No, 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 no. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. We've known that all along. History has shown us that repeatedly. And we know what the monetary system is doing, unlike the Federal Reserve, which doesn't do money. We know what the monetary system is doing because the markets, the monetary system itself tells us what's going on through curves. And the curves have said, this isn't an inflationary period. This is nothing more than a transitory supply shock. And transitory supply shocks, by the way, do take several years to work themselves out. So there isn't their money. We know that the supply shock cases are out there and we can see all of these things. But curves are behaving differently lately. In fact, rates have been rising somewhat quickly over the past several weeks, really going back to the early part of September. Does that mean that the markets are changing? Their mind? Are they telling us that we're at risk of inflation? Jay Powell, the Federal Reserve chairman, was asked about rising interest rates just a couple weeks ago, back at his press conference in September. And I have to agree with what the guy said, especially as it comes to the, the condition of interest rates over the last month and a half, two months or so. What he said was, you know, rates have moved up significantly. I think it's always hard to say precisely, but it's most most people do a common decomposition of the increase and they'll they'll he's struggling a little bit here. The view will be it's not, it's not mostly about inflation expectations. It's mostly about other things, you know, either term premiums, yeah, or real re, real yields, and it's it's hard to be precise about this. Again, he's he's having trouble explaining it. Of course, everyone's got their models that they'll give you a very precise answer but they give you different answers. So, but essentially they, they're they moving up because, it's not because of inflation. It's because probably, it'll probably have to do something with stronger growth, I would say, more and more supply of US treasuries. So again, I'm going to agree with Jay Powell here because all of the evidence that we have says consumer price expectations, whether from consumers themselves or the marketplace, those remain exceptionally tame here. So rates are rising. It can't be from inflation. It can't be from expectations over prices. I'm going to disagree with Powell about the other things, and we'll see about those too. Can it be supply factors? Can it be because of stronger growth potential? That's what we're going to unlock and unpack today. What's, what's really behind the bond sell-off and what can we look at from maybe recent history to tell us about not just economic expectations, but maybe what to expect about interest rates for the rest of this year and into next year. But first, I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. Eurodollar University has memberships available. In fact, in the membership section, I just did a video just recently on this topic, yield curves, what they are, what are term premiums? What was Jay, Jay Powell talking about when he mentioned term premiums? Well, basics video number seven goes over the basics of bond curves. In a video that I'm just now starting to finish up, basics video number eight, we're gonna talk about money curves. What are the money curves telling us? What are the fundamental properties that go into these things and what type of information can we get by focusing on them? Very crucial information. Very important topic, money and bond curves. That's what we got at the membership site at Eurodollar University, along with all of the background information and the explanations for what the Eurodollar actually is. Why we need to look at curves. Why can't we look at the hidden shadow money system? All of that's available at our membership site, eurodollar.university. So Jay Powell said, yeah, I see interest rates are going up. And he didn't say, but he, he certainly... It was in the background of his thoughts here that he was he was okay with rates going up because the Fed has been trying to push rates up. And ever since last September and October, there's a clue there, rates have been 
lower, steady to lower. When the Fed keeps trying to push them higher, they don't seem to want to go higher. So the Fed isn't looking at this as inflation expectations. They're looking at this rise in interest rates as something's going on where the market is finally getting with the program of higher for longer, as well as maybe the soft landing. That's what he said. If it's not inflation expectations, and it's not, as you'll see in a minute, then it must be stronger growth and it must be uh, maybe supply issues from the Treasury deluging us, deluging with so much additional, you know, the federal government going crazy with its deficit. That's a possibility. But while the growth and supply factors, term premiums, forget about those, while growth and supply factors could be a reason why rates are going up, as I mentioned in a recent video discussion with Stephen Van Meter, why aren't we seeing that in the two year? The two year would be going up faster and farther if it was growth expectations, if it was supply, because supply that impacts the two year as well as higher for longer and all the growth stuff that would be, if that was responsible for what's going on the long end of the curve, we would see that in the two year. So before we get to, let's, let's, before we talk about the supply versus growth stuff let's let's make sure we eliminate the inflation expectations let's let's talk about the consumer price part of decomposing these bond yields we just got some more information today from the federal reserve bank in new york the, the fellow the folks in new york who do this monthly survey of consumers and have been doing it for over a decade now we have a decade of consumer price data, not just consumer price data, but also consumer income expectations, unemployment expectations, a whole bunch of expectations from Americans themselves. And as far as it goes with price expectations, those continue to be relatively benign. The one year ahead median price expectation was 3.67% in the month of September. That was up, but up only four basis points, just from 3.63% in August. And it had been 3.55% in July. So even though it's up for the second month in a row, it's up very small amounts each month. That's despite the fact that we've had lots of gasoline, energy, oil prices, and some food prices too, that have risen lately. So Liz, <laughs> that have risen lately and quite sharply too, especially gasoline. So even though gasoline is up a lot, it isn't filtering into consumer price expectations, certainly not at the short end. In fact, the one year ahead median had been 3.83 back in June and 4.07 back in May. We're well below May and June, even though oil prices and gasoline prices are substantially higher in between. So though the rate, the median has ticked up the last couple of months, the question we have to ask ourselves is why hasn't it gone up so much more? The three-year ahead price expectation, that was 3% in the month of September, which was up from 279 in August, but it had been 2.91% in July and 2.95% in June. So basically the three-year ahead expectation remains relatively constant throughout really since the early part of this year. Consumers are not expecting a whole lot more than energy, gasoline, and maybe medical stuff and things like that. Other prices, they're not really expecting that to be out of line. They're not expecting anything abnormal to go on over the intermediate and longer term. And 3%, which, I mean, that sounds like it's above the Fed's target, but 3% for the three-year median is pretty much where it had been before the transitory effect on consumer prices. So consumers are telling us what Jay Powell already did. They don't see uh, rampant consumer price pressures over the next year, over the years ahead, still the lingering impacts from the supply shock, but those continue to diminish despite the variations in oil and energy prices. Maybe more important when we start thinking about beyond inflation expectation in bond yields, let's talk about growth expectations a little bit here because the FRBNY survey of consumers also had some data about growth and credit expectations that are probably not probably, that are relevant to what we're trying to get at here. The income expectation for one year ahead, that was 3.03% in the month of September, up just slightly, so really not much of a change from August 2.94, down from July and June, which had been 3.19% in each of those. And this one had been as high as 4.58% back last year. So income expectations continue to diminish 
as Americans at the upper end say, we're not seeing the same revenue or the same wage and income growth that we saw before. And Americans at the lower end are more concerned about not having a job because the mean probability that U.S. and unemployment rate rises one year ahead has moved back above 40% in the month of September, according to this survey data. So they they ask, they ask all of these Americans what they think about the unemployment rate moving ahead, and they crunch the probabilities through a bunch of statistical processes and say the probability, the mean probability is about 40%. So it's above, back up above 40%. It had been 38.5% in August and 36.7% in July. So it's moving back higher again. You can see the same pattern. We had the unemployment rate expectation move higher early part of this year as Americans were more concerned about recession and then the disinflationary trend, which made everybody a little bit more optimistic. And then that wore off as the summertime came on. And the summertime has been really bad as far as the global economy is concerned, the U.S. economy too. We've talked about incomes and everything else. So now we're back into thinking there's going to be unemployment again. The recession is back on in the minds of a lot of consumers. And one reason why, they also told the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, they can't get credit. The number of those who said, or responded to the survey that, that credit is a lot or much harder to get a year than a year ago was a record high 19.01%. And that's a big jump from 16.16, which would have been a record last month, and 13.79% back in August. So big jump in those who are saying credit is much harder to get, although that's balanced out to a degree by those who respond and credit is somewhat harder to get. That number actually fell to 41.76% from 43.61% in August. But you add those together, those who say credit is much harder to get compared to a year ago, plus those who say it's somewhat harder to get, that's 60.77%. That's a record high. And we're getting too close to two thirds of the survey who are saying, yeah, credit's becoming tighter. Credit's becoming tighter. We're more worried about our jobs. We don't see the same level of income growth. No wonder they're not seeing price changes or prices as a big threat like they had last year and to the beginning part of this year. This, of course, is nothing new because we see the same thing happening in markets, tips markets, tips break-evens. Again, we're going to agree with Jay Powell. It can't be inflation risk because that's consumers don't see it, nor does the marketplace. And just like the consumer survey data that we just went over, the tips marketplace has been incredibly consistent over the last several months, not just with the bond sell-off, the long-end bond sell-off, not the two-year, the long-end bond sell-off, but also oil prices. If oil prices were inflation, as so many people say, we would see tips break-evens going crazy. Now, short-end break-evens have been rising, but the, the medium and longer-term ones that we really need to focus on, those haven't budged at all, which is very different from what happened in early 2022. The break-even rates, which are a measure of markets' expectations for the CPI rate, which, I mean, the CPI rate is what tips pay off. The government pays you back on inflation protection, from the CPI rate. So market participants are not seeing the CPI rate responding over the intermediate and longer term based on oil prices or the unemployment rate or expectations or any of the stuff that the Fed talks about. Hot economy, soft landing, none of it. The inflation break-evens, the five-year break-even was as of today before the close, 2.16% or 216 basis points. And remember, you don't take the break-even rates literally. It's not the market saying that we expect the CPI to average 2.16% over the next five years. This is sort of a relative measure of what the consumer prices are going to be like over that term. So the five-year break-even, 216 basis points. It was 217 basis points Friday. It was 214 basis points Thursday with the oil price sell-off. And it had been as high as 227 basis points on the 28th when oil was reaching its peak, and 227 basis points was nowhere near where oil was. So when tips break-evens used to follow along with oil prices quite closely up until recently, unlike how they used to follow along pretty closely, especially over the last couple of years. The 10-year break-even at 231 basis points, that's the same as it was on Friday. That's the same as it was on Thursday. And it only got to be a 239 basis points back on the 28th when oil prices were at their highest. So again, no real response from market expectation for consumer prices, despite the fact that oil is really going up here. 
It's like the market, like consumers, are expecting prices outside of energy to more than make up the difference. So energy prices go up, which destroys enough demand that other prices have to come down in response, balancing out break-evens for now, balancing out for consumers their expectations of one year ahead for prices too. So as far as Jay Powell is concerned, he seems to be on solid ground for once when he says the rise in interest rates, back-end interest rates, not the front-end, back-end interest rates must be about something other than inflation expectations because all of the data, and it's not just the U.S., around the rest of the world too, the market data, the consumer survey data, not just FRB and why we see this in the University of Michigan and other surveys too, they tell us it's not consumer prices. That's not what's going on here. And it's not likely growth expectations either. As you saw in the consumer consumer data from FRB and Y, consumers themselves, Americans, are really becoming concerned about unemployment and the economy. Instead, this is beginning to look a lot like the 2018 case. And if you remember 2018, go back to 2018, a lot of similarities, including rising interest rates through August and September. And not just in U.S. Treasuries, but also German bonds and Japanese government yields or Japanese government bonds too. Rates were going up in August and September and everybody said, well, of course, Jay Powell and the Fed are aggressive. They're going to raise rates. We've got an economy that's too strong. It needs to be slowed down. And so rates are going to go higher. Growth is going to be relatively good. There's going to be a soft landing. It's going to be terrific. And as rates rose, especially the back end in August and September, a lot of people thought as now, maybe the market was changing its mind because before then, remember the yield curve had flattened out, confounding pretty much everybody because in early 2018, everybody was convinced inflation was gonna be a problem. And it seemed like the market disagreed with that while it was flattening. And then in August and September, suddenly the market seemed to get with the program, or at least the Fed's program. But that only lasted until early October, October 4th, I believe, the 10-year put in its top. But interest rates didn't go immediately back down, though they started to in other places around the world. Treasury still went sideways throughout the rest of October until the early part of November, and then they caught up with where the rest of the world was already going. Because by then, it had become clear enough the economic situation was nowhere near as strong and as resilient as everybody had been saying. There was no consumer price pressures despite all of the claims of a labor shortage throughout 2018. And that the pessimism that the market had been pricing earlier in 2018 when the curve was just flattening out and euro dollar futures had already inverted, those proved to be the fundamental signals. The September effect, that was something else entirely. And though the Fed misconstrued the increase in interest rates as, okay, we're starting to get the market on our side, it really was only a temporary setback. And in 2023, we can see this dis distinction by all of the data I just cited, as well as, again, the two-year treasury, which is not selling. In fact, today it's back below 5% yet again. One thing also to keep in mind as we finish up here is that the economic statistics that many people were depending upon to say, well, the 2018 economy doesn't look all that bad. Maybe it's slowing down a little bit. As I mentioned in a recent video on GDP, the statistics made it look better than it actually was because only years later, after several benchmark revisions, do we see that the economy was in much worse shape, more, much closer to what the markets were pricing at the time when you factor in the September effect and, 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 not, and not paid attention to that. The economic data shows up later as, yeah, we really did have a brush with the recession in the United States and maybe really would have turned into a recession in 2019. Japan, for example, they admitted only in 2022 that, yes, there actually was a recession late 2018 into 2019. So growth expectations that maybe the Fed says about the current period, we have to keep in mind 2018 too. So we've got a number of parallels, starting with the fact that we don't see any inflation risk because inflation isn't what they tell you it is. Despite the fact that Jay Powell might be right about interest rates this time, he's still worried about inflation from other possible explanations. But the yield curve, especially at the front end of the yield curve today, tells us the same thing that has been telling us all throughout the last couple of years. Inflation, inflation is a monetary phenomenon and there isn't the money to create inflation. 
So what we're left with are the, is nothing more than the lingering impacts of the supply shock and the occasional supply and geopolitical impacts from oil prices. But otherwise, we're continuing to move toward deflationary recession. Yes, as I said in today's video, the economic statistics like GDP tend to overstate the economic case during these inflection periods. If you want to check out the details there, it's at the video link below me. Thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University subscribers and our Eurodollar University members. Until next time, take care.